Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. In this video, we're going to learn the two to four player game My Village, designed by Inca and Marcus Brand and published by Stronghold Games. Your village is growing, and as it does, the tales of your townspeople and their deeds are recorded in the village stories, which, if protected, will help raise the prestige of your community as you grow crops, satisfy customers, house monks, and travel the distant lands. In the end, your village could be the greatest. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, put the main board on the table, placing the gray rat die here with the rat piece itself on the space matching the number of players. I'm setting up a two player game, so it'll go here. These are the village cards, which you'll sort by their colors and types. Note that they have two sides distinguished by a dark and a light frame. Keep all stacks showing the dark frame face up. When arranged for play, they should look something like this. First, there are the four church cards, which can be put out in any order. I've overlapped them here to save space. Next to them, in any order, are the four council chambers. And above this, place the stack of four identical meeting place cards, with these tokens nearby labeled 212. Next, place the three shuffled stacks of monk cards separated into piles based on the symbols found here in the bottom right-hand corner. These fields are all identical and they can be placed in a single stack. The customer cards should be shuffled into a stack here, and then six are drawn and placed light side up like this. These travel cards are sorted into separate shuffled piles based on the letters found in the bottom left hand corner, arranged from A all the way to E. Beneath, lay out the four cards representing the five different types of craft buildings which are distinguished by the symbols in the top left hand corners. Their order within each column doesn't matter. These are story point tokens, day laborers, and black markers that you'll keep near the board, and I'm gonna store some of them in cups just to make it easier for me to move things around here on the table. Speaking of which, I've also placed all of the cards on some custom cutout foam core so I can move things around a little bit easier during this video. Now give each player a village board randomly. They look similar, but each have a unique number pairing in this area here, which we'll learn about later. Now have each player place a Grim Reaper onto their bridge and a Headman on to their main house along with a time marker of the same color on the cloud just to the right of their bridge. Also collect five of these black markers, placing them as villagers onto the colored hexagonal spaces found on your board as I'm doing here. Then to help during the game, give each of the players one of these overview cards. Randomly pick a player to take the starting player token, palm side up, and also give them one gold. Give two gold to the second player, and three to the next player if you had one, and four to the fourth player. These black markers will represent different things in the game based on where they're placed. Here, they represent villagers, but they become gold when they're placed on a person's money barn. So these will represent two gold when placed on the second player's barn. Finally, based on the number of players, you'll use a certain number of dice. In a three-player game, you'll use only six white dice and two black ones. But in a two-player game, like we've set up here, you'll use all of the dice. And that's the setup. In my village, you're trying to build the most prestigious village by expanding it, traveling to new locations, trading with the locals, and raising generations of villagers to help you run it. But next, let's take a look at the player boards. During the game, you'll add cards to the side of the village in rows beside the indicated professions known as religion, council, harvest, travel, crafts, and the market. Most will have space for a villager, which activates that area. Without a villager by a location, you most often won't be able to add cards to that area or activate them as we'll learn about later. Due to the space needed for the cards around a player's board, we'll remove the second player from this video demonstration as they won't be required to help us learn how to play the game. The game is played over a series of rounds broken into two main phases, starting with the preparation phase. Here, the first player puts one story point onto the starting player token and this can hold any number of those story points. However, if at the start of the turn, this hand is face down, first flip it face up and then place the new point. Now take all of the dice and roll them to create a dice pool. As a reminder of these steps, you'll find them illustrated here at the top of your overview card. Next is the action phase, where the first player will then perform these three steps and then the next player in clockwise order and so on until each player has performed their actions and then the round ends. However, in a two player game, once both players have taken their actions, they'll then again each perform these three steps 
and then the round concludes. Either way, the first step is taking any two dice from the pool and adding the pips together to get a single result known as the banner value. The colors of the dice you choose will have no impact on their final combined banner value. But if you took a black die, this represents a plague visiting your village, and now you must advance your time marker two spaces on this track. You're reminded of this right here. Time passes by moving in a clockwise order in this direction, so in this case I'd move my marker like so. If instead I had taken two black dice, then my marker would advance four spaces. Now before combining the values of your dice, you can modify them in one of two ways. First, for each coin you spend from your money burn, you can modify a die's value up or down by one, to a minimum of one and a maximum of six. Spent coins are then returned from your money barn to the supply. Alternatively, if you have a meeting place in your village, a location we'll learn about later, you can discard black markers from here and for each, change a die to any value you'd like. Once you've made your adjustments, you combine the two numbers to form your final banner value. You'll use this to activate banners found in various places around your village and on the main board. These options are indicated here on step two of your overview card. One option you have, as represented by this symbol, is to activate exactly one black banner showing the exact value of your combined dice. In this case, a value of 11. All cards in the general display, except for these six, will show black banners. So with this action, your dice can be assigned to any one of these that exactly match. In this case, having chose a value of 11, that leaves only this black banner here on a field, which also shows an 11. If the player had instead chosen these two white dice of a value of six, not only would they not have spent as much time as they did, but now there are several more black banner options for them to choose from. Sometimes a banner will show two different numbers, and this means you can match your dice to either value in order to activate it. As a further example, let's say a player wanted to claim this travel card from the display. First of all, we know that they would had to have chosen two dice which had a combined banner value of seven, which is shown here. However, sometimes there are other costs as well. For example, this shows two time. We know how to spend time, so we'd advance the marker like this. But there's also a horse symbol showing here. A horse is a type of good. Goods are paid for with markers on good spaces in your village. We'll learn about them later, but here's an example of a stable, and this represents a horse. So I could spend this marker returning it to the supply to satisfy this payment. Or the slash here means we could instead pay two gold. The dice that you chose will remain out of the pool so that the other players can't choose them. And after paying the cost, you resolve any symbols shown beneath the banner. Sometimes these will provide you with other goods or coins, but always it will include flipping the card over, which is represented by this symbol. So we would flip it over like this. We'll go over the various effects and benefits found on the cards a little later, but I also want to point out the black banner found on the starting player token itself. By assigning either dice values of four or 10 to this token, you can then collect all of the story points on it and place them on the tree here of your player board. You'll then flip the hand over and place it in front of yourself. You'll be the start player next round, but note, while the token is flipped over, the black banner is not available, and that means it can no longer be activated during this round. While face up, in a three or four player game, you may not activate this banner if you already control the hand. But in a two player game, after your first turn in a round, you may choose to activate it yourself, collecting any of its story points and retaining control of it. There's also a banner on the steward's office here which you can activate to attract future customers that you'll serve later to gain points. If you spend one time, you can take any one of these customers from the face-up display. Or if you spend two time, you can take any two. Throw in a coin as well and you can collect any three or three time in a coin to take any four. You place collected customers to the right of your market area, and to save space on the table, I recommend that you overlap them. You then draw from this stack and flip over enough customers to replace the ones that were just taken. Instead of using your dice to activate a single black banner, you can activate one or more white ones in your village that match the combined value of the dice you chose. I've assigned a total banner value of five from my chosen dice, so in this case, I could activate either of these two locations or even this one because a question mark can be assigned any value. However, keep in mind like black banners there may be other costs you have to pay like time or other goods. And in the case of this customer they're looking for a good I don't yet have. So I could not activate that card at this time. 
Also, when acquiring cards with black banners or activating ones with white banners, you'll typically need to have a villager on the profession space of the row where that card is either going to go or be activated from. So despite the value of my dice here and a willingness to spend the required time, if this villager was not present, I could not activate either of these craft locations. There are some exceptions to that rule, but we'll look at that a little bit later. I should also mention that if you are activating more than one white banner, you can resolve them in any order, but you cannot activate the same banner more than once. Also, if you can and plan to activate the meeting place, then you must do this as the last action you resolve of your turn. You'll also find a white play banner in your village and each player's values on their board are unique. Having a villager of a particular profession is not required to activate this banner, and since I do have a value of five assigned, I could trigger this, which will allow me to collect one story point and add it to my tree. You're reminded of this by the one story point symbol on the kite being flown by this child in the village. Players also have a white school banner here on their board. Let's take a closer look and see how this works. If the school is empty when activated, you place a marker from the supply onto this first space. If later you were to activate the school again, you may either move the student present immediately up this arrow, spending one time, like so, and then placing it onto any empty villager space. Or instead of doing that, for no time at all, you can simply advance it to the right, like so. We're leaving the student in school to learn a little more before we send them off on their profession. If there is a student on this space when you activate this banner, then you may either place a new marker on the leftmost space, or instead, move the student here, up this arrow, spending one time and then placing it on an empty profession, but now collecting two story points from the supply and adding them to your tree. If both of these spaces are full when you activate your school, send one of your students there up the appropriate line, paying the cost and gaining the appropriate benefit, and place them on an empty profession space. Lastly, for your action, instead of activating a single black banner or any number of white banners, you may choose to activate the black question mark banner found here in the center of your player board. The question mark symbol means you can use any two dice you've chosen from the pool to activate this ability, and it also costs one time. Now you move your head man to one adjacent space on this track. If you're on the house, that means you'll move to this space with a coin, adding a coin to your money burn. If you activate and instead move from the coin to this space, you add three points to your story tree. If you're ever on the coin and use this action to move back to the house, you move all of the story points you have on the tree to your house. Only those here are considered safe and will be counted towards your final score at the end of the game. The final step after taking your actions for the turn is to resolve any of your villagers passing away if that happened. This will occur if you moved your time marker past the bridge. As soon as this would happen, place your Grim Reaper on top of the marker and then continue moving the marker as required. The Grim Reaper will act as a reminder to resolve a death at the end of your turn. To do this, move the Reaper back to the bridge and now choose any one of your villagers, but not students in the school, and remove them, placing them on a coffin space of the main board. There are both colored, chronicle, and gray, anonymous grave spaces. If there's a free chronicle space in the color of the deceased villager's profession, then you can place the villager there, collecting either two or one story point, which you'll add to your tree. If a matching villager space was not available, then place the villager in the lowest valued free anonymous grave space. The numbers here just allow you to quickly count up how many anonymous grave spaces have already been used, which we'll see later can help you determine the end of the game. Regardless of the villager's final resting place, now take the gray rat die and roll it, moving the rat that number of spaces forward. So in this case, three spaces. As long as the rat does not enter this large rat invasion space, your turn is over. However, if it would ever enter this space, each player loses half of the story points found in their tree, rounding down, placing them back in the supply. Remember, story points in your house cannot be lost. After the invasion is resolved, move the rat to the space that corresponds to the number of players. As an aside, if your last villager would ever pass away, leaving all five of your profession spaces empty, then you must immediately hire a day laborer taking one of these tiles 
and collecting a marker from the pool, placing it on any one of the empty spaces. You will not be able to remove day laborer tiles you've collected, and they'll each be worth minus five points from your score at the end of the game. Now that we understand the flow of the game as shown on this overview card, let's take a look at how each of the different village card types work. These are the craft buildings, and no player may have more than one of each of the five different types as distinguished by the symbols found here. The way each works is similar, but the banner values may be different. To collect one, you must not only satisfy the conditions of the banner, but also have a villager on the craftsman space of your board. You then resolve the symbols listed here on the card that you've collected. This tells us to flip it over and then place a marker from the supply onto one of these available spaces. These markers represent the goods of that building. For example, each marker here will represent a plow. So if I need to pay a plow for the cost of another action, I can simply remove them from these spaces as necessary. Now, if you have craft buildings and a villager on this space, then when activating white banners that match your dice values, you can add an additional marker, as shown here, to one of the available spaces. Once all of the spaces are full, you cannot activate this location anymore. To claim a field, match the banner value on it and pay one time. You then gain a coin, as shown here, and flip the field over. Fields, unlike other buildings, do not require you to have a villager here because, well, there isn't a space for one. And over the course of the game, you can collect any number of fields to put into this row. Once on its light side, you can activate the cost here of one time in order to gain another coin. And if you've placed a plow that you own here, which you can do at any point during the game if you have one, then you'll also gain a second coin from it at the same time. The plow can stay here as long as you want, but you can still discard it to pay a plow cost later if required. We saw earlier how to add customers to your personal market areas by activating the black banner on the main board. But I also wanna to mention to do that, you do not need to have a villager on this space. But if you wish to serve a customer you've already collected, you will need a merchant there. Serving a customer happens when you satisfy their white banner requirements. For example, both of these need either a four or a 10 showing on the dice that you've chosen. I've satisfied that condition, but for this customer, I'll need to spend a good of any type. That's what this question mark means. And for this customer, they want a good of any type plus a horse. Well, at this point, I only have a horse. So I'll satisfy this customer by spending it, returning it to the supply. Once you've satisfied the customer, flip the card over as shown here and place it beneath your market area where it will be worth the points shown in the upper left hand corner at the end of the game. The top card of each of the different travel stacks will show a different cost value. But within the stack, all of the cards will look the same. The values shown here are the potential points you'll find on the other side. So the top card may be worth three points or it may be worth four. When taking travel cards, you must do so in alphabetical order as indicated by the values here. And you may not have more than one of the same letter. There is one card that can change that. When you get to the D pile, if you travel there and reveal the chapel, it'll be shown on the illustration, then that will end your travels. You cannot later collect an E travel card as well. Either way, to claim a travel tile, make sure you have a traveler in your village and pay the cost shown here and flip it over, placing it in your travel area. It will be worth the points shown here at the end of the game. It will also show a gray banner. Now, if paying the cost of a future travel card, in this case, travel card B, you must also pay the gray banner cost of the single most recently played travel card you previously collected. So to take this travel on a future action, I'll need to spend two time and either a horse or two money and then one extra money. Remember, you only pay the extra cost on the most recent travel card that you placed. So now, if we were traveling to C, we would only have to pay the extra barrel, not the additional gold from this one. There are four different churches, each with a unique ability. And once you've paid the cost, you can take any one of them. But once you have a church, you cannot take another. Do keep in mind, in order to take a church, you will have to have an abbot in your village. Claimed villages are then flipped over and placed here. This church will allow you to ignore up to two rat invasions of your choosing. When a rat invasion would occur that you wish to block, place a marker on one of these spaces. The rest of the players will still be affected, but you won't be. With this church, each time you take the action to attract new customers to your village, First, reveal a new customer from the pile, adding it to the display, and then take for free 
any one customer before other customers that you paid to take. When you have the Travel Church, each time you would take a travel card, first look at its light side. Then you may choose to place it on the bottom of the stack and draw a new one from the top, but you must keep that second one. This church simply counts as an extra window, and this will gain you more points at the end of the game, as we'll see. These are the monk cards which you can collect once you have a church in your village and an abbot visitor. To claim a monk, pick the top one from any of these stacks and resolve its one-time effect here after paying the cost. These different effects are explained in the rule book on page 10, and I'll leave that for you to discover on your own. A monk you collect, you then flip over and place in this area beside your church like this. Future monks you collect, you can overlap, but make sure you can still see the lit up windows here. And note that you can never have more than six monks total in your village. These are the four council chambers, and like churches, each provide a unique effect and a player can only have one in their village which can be taken by paying the cost so long as they have a councilman villager. The banner action on this one allows the player to take two coins when collected and two coins each time its white banner is activated. This one allows you to place a marker on it when you first collect it and each time that you activate its white banner. Tokens on this council chamber can be used in place of any other goods cost that you would require. This is the area council. Place a token on it when it's first collected, picking any one of the five colors shown to cover up. Activating its white banner effect will allow you to place more markers as well. At the end of the game, you'll gain one point for each card in your village matching the color of the spaces you've covered. But keep in mind, for the purposes of scoring the blue cards, you'll only gain a point for each customer you've served, not for the ones you've simply collected. This is the Population Council, which also allows you to place a marker when you first gain it. And again, you'll cover one of these colored spaces. When you activate the white banner, you can place future markers as well. At the end of the game, you'll gain four points for each villager of the various types you've covered still present in your village. Finally, we have the Meeting Place cards. They're all identical within this stack, and each player may only have one, but you will need a councilman in your village to take it. Once collected, you'll gain one of these tokens shown here as well as a story token for your tree. Then you'll flip it over and add a marker to one of the available spaces here. These markers can be used once you've claimed two dice during your turn when you're preparing your banner value. A marker can be removed from here to change any one die you have to a side of your choosing. Also when you first claim the meeting space Take this token and place it beside any other white banner in your village. That means this location can now also be activated by these new numbers. This field, for example, can be activated either by an 11 or a 2 or a 12. But even if you're using one of these two numbers, you still have to pay the other additional costs that are shown on the banner that you're activating. As long as you still have a councilman here, then you can activate this banner again on a future turn, allowing you to relocate this bonus token gain a single story point, and place another marker onto one of these empty spaces. And those are all of the different building types, but before going on, let's go over a couple of other quick rules. We know in most cases, if you don't have a villager by a row, you can't gain or activate cards there. However, any markers representing goods can still be spent from those rows to satisfy other costs. Also, if buildings are worth points at the end of the game, like this one, you'll still gain them even if you don't have a villager by that row. Also, when activating a banner, you can choose to forfeit any parts of its benefits. For example, this one would allow us to move the token, but if you don't want to, you don't have to. And in some cases, you'll have to forfeit some of the benefits. For example, this would allow us to place another marker, but there's no space to place an extra one. It should also be noted that once a card has been put in your village, it can't be removed. And while cards are limited in the game, meaning that once they run out, you cannot collect more of them, story points, markers, and laborers are not limited. And if they run out, use a suitable replacement. Also keep in mind, your personal story points are public information, so don't hide them from the other players. The game will continue until the end of a round in which the total number of deceased villagers equals at least the value shown here on the main board based on the number of players. So in this two-player game, we would need to have at least nine deceased villagers 
as we do now, so that would mean this is the last round of the game. Now you can use the included notepad to score the various points. First, your total number of lit up church windows will score you points based on the table found here. So for three windows, we'd gain seven points. Then add the points on your council area buildings, your fields, the places you traveled to, and your served customers. However, deduct points if you have any day laborers. Remember, minus five for each one. You also gain any story points found on your main house, but ignore those still on your tree. Whichever player controls the starting player token gains an additional point, but ignore any story tokens found on it. The player with the most points wins. In the case of a tie, the tied players sum up their coins, any goods they might have, and story points left in their tree. The highest total breaks the tie and wins, but if there's still a tie, the tied players share the victory. And that's how you play My Village. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.